book of the month. Follow the link to buy your copy. Hey, it's September. Already. And our catechism classes based on the Heidelberg Catechism have recommenced. If you haven't got a copy of the catechism, then I would urge you to purchase a copy, keep it and read it, for it will be a worthwhile addition to your library. And a personal paper copy is probably essential for any meaningful study of the plain and practical Christian teachings that the Heidelberg Catechism contains. So for September, I've made the Heidelberg Catechism my book of the month. Links to buy your copy at just £2.95 can be found in the episode notes or contact me personally by email. My email address, bob at bobmacavoy.co.uk bob at bobmcevoy dot co dot uk September's Book of the Month The Heidelberg Catechism When you buy a copy, a small amount of the price supports this podcast. Welcome back to our series of three short podcasts on the life of Anthony Norris Groves. In our last episode, we looked at his early life and his conversion and his call. His first missionary station was in the city of Baghdad in modern Iraq. And as we shall see, his journey to get there and the hardships that he endured there are a wonderful example of Christian perseverance, born of the knowledge that God had called him into service for his kingdom. And patient endurance, depending on the goodness and grace and calling of God. So let's find out more about A.N. Groves and the mission to Baghdad. You're listening to the Semper Reformata podcast with me, Bob McAvoy. Morris Groves believed that a man who was called to ministry should obey that call without any appeal for funds, but simply trusting in God, believing that the God who called him would provide for all his needs. And Groves believed that there was a great need among the people of the Middle East. Well, needless to say, that wasn't welcome news to the Thompson family. His wife Mary's father, Mr Thompson the dentist, was absolutely horrified, was outraged by Groves' reckless plan, even going so far as to write to Groves, demanding a repayment of a thousand-pound loan that had been made to Groves' father before Norris left the country. Still, Groves left England without seeking any financial backing, travelling with his wife and his two sons, Henry and Frank, on a yacht to St. Petersburg in Russia, and then overland to Baghdad. That journey took six months. The yacht Osprey. I probably don't think of this as similar to the pleasure boats that you see in Bangor Marina. A larger sailing craft, she sailed from Gravesend on the 12th of June, 1829, with the Groves family on board, along with Norris's sister, Lydia, a Mr. Bathy from Scotland, Miss Charlotte Taylor and Mr. John Keto, the children's tutor. And throughout the journey and later on in Baghdad, he taught the children by means of sign language. A wealthy lady, a Mrs. Taylor, whose husband was a foreign office official in Basra and later in Baghdad, also made the journey along with the party, thus ensuring her own safe passage. With her went her four servants. Lydia, Norris's sister, became unwell during the sea leg of the journey and had to return to England. The part of the journey over land was absolutely horrendous. The road was dangerous. It was often little more than a dirt track, 
The missionaries attached themselves for safety to larger commercial caravans travelling the same route, but even those were attacked. Religious tensions between the various Muslim sects, warring tribes, poor and uncomfortable accommodation, bad food and water, exhausted horses, damage to vehicles, rain and flood, all those conditions made the journey overland a nightmare. But the missionary group were determined to get to their destination, even though they were warned of the dangers, and again they prayed and trusted in the Lord for their safe arrival. And they found encouragement along the way, meeting and enjoying fellowship with Christians of many different denominations and nationalities. They met and befriended Dr. and Mrs. William Glenn. Dr. Glenn was translating the Old Testament into Farsi, and Groves and Glenn became great friends. They did have theological differences, but they enjoyed a warm, brotherly relationship. Further along the route, the missionaries enjoyed the hospitality of a group of German Lutheran pietists who were of a similar mind in regard to missions. One of these brethren, Karl Fander, actually joined the team to work in Baghdad and was a great blessing to Groves along the way, and his knowledge of the local languages was a huge benefit. However, although the missionary group had now gained another traveller, they were destined to lose Charlotte Taylor at Tabriz. She met a young man there working for the British East India Company, a Mr Nesbitt. Nesbitt was a committed Christian, and she remained behind and later married him. Nesbitt had made a generous donation to Grove's costs, but it still saddened the missionary that he had lost a valuable worker. He reached the conclusion that probably young unmarried women were not suitable as missionary material. The travellers reached Baghdad on the morning of the Lord's Day on the 6th of December 1829 to be welcomed along the way by a major tailor. Taylor had provided for them a small house enough for their needs attached to his own house and he permitted them to live there rent free. But life in Baghdad was a time of very great trial. The missionary work began. An elementary school was opened using the Bible in the local languages as the primary reading text. Grove employed his medical abilities to reach out in friendship to the locals and the local people being Muslims, some were more helpful than others. In his memoirs, Groves recorded that the mullah, assigned to Kitto, would converse with him and read with him, but refused to translate for him on the basis that he would do nothing to help spread the Christian religion or to share any form of Islamic knowledge with an infidel. And on the family front, the Groves family were blessed with the arrival of a baby girl. The mission itself, though, was largely unproductive. It was seriously hindered by a series of natural and human disasters. The heat of the city was unbearable. It forced them to sleep outdoors on the roof of the house. Civil war broke out in Baghdad, and the city suffered siege conditions, floods, food shortages, and as a result of the deprivation, plague. Fander was only to remain for a limited time, and Groves began to worry that he and Mary and Kitto would be left without Christian counsel and fellowship. In September 1830, a party of brethren left Dublin for Baghdad, travelling by ship to Spain, overland across Spain, and then by ship across the Mediterranean to Palestine. That party included Dr. Edward Cronin, some of his family members and others, including an Anglican Mr. Frank Newman, the brother of John Henry Newman, later to become Cardinal Newman. The objective was to work with Groves on the medical and educational side of the mission, and they even brought with them a printing press, transported in two large heavy crates. In 1831, Cholera struck with a vengeance. Grove speaks of the peaceful serenity of his wife as she contracted the illness and faced death. He wrote in his memoirs, and I quote, 
all the conversation of my dear dying wife for these twelve months past, but especially as our difficulties and trials increased, was on the peace she enjoyed with the Lord. Her assurance of her Lord's love never forsook her, even after she felt herself attacked by the plague. When she thought on her Lord's love, she was confident in his graciousness. It was that plague that claimed the life of Mary Groves in 1831, and also the life of their recently born daughter. Groves himself survived the illness, but the work in Baghdad was now in totters. Lives devastated by so many deaths, buildings destroyed by floods, the school depleted in terms of numbers of pupils and teachers. The Dublin party remained in Baghdad after Grove's own departure for India in 1833, but the area was hit by plague twice thereafter, and the Irish team eventually decided to abandon the work and return home. Edward Cronin left first, then the others, and by the end of 1834 nothing of the Baghdad mission remained, despite the fact that Groves had written several times to other missions, pleading for help. In 1834, Groves was invited to visit India. A British Army colonel, Arthur Cotton, had visited Baghdad, and he had expressed an interest in meeting Groves. Cotton had read Christian Devotedness, Groves' book, and had been challenged by it. He was sure that the work at Baghdad was at such a low ebb that Grove's talents really could be better used elsewhere. India, on the other hand, had recently opened up for the gospel, thanks to a law enacted at Westminster in Parliament, which granted a new charter to the British East India Company and included a clause encouraging missionary activities in all of the regions of India that were under the company's jurisdiction. How different from modern-day legislation passed by the so-called Mother of Parliaments. Anyway, Cotton was sure that Grove should go and visit the mission field and find out if there was an opportunity to expand the Lord's work there. And Groves was keen to go, remembering that, away back in his boyhood, his initial call to missionary work, when he was at school in the church at Farnham, was actually to India. So they sailed from Baghdad down the Euphrates, into the Persian Gulf, and on to India. And another chapter in Norris's life had begun. And in our next podcast, we'll find out how the Lord blessed and prospered his work in that spiritually needy land of India. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.